Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, our 14th meeting. My name is Diego Arduan. I'm one of the organizers of Bright Garden Voices. Bright Garden Voices is a grassroots initiative which provides a platform for dialogue between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, we host online meetings and events where guests share their experience and ideas about um, the Armenian and Azerbaijani conflict and other issues surrounding this topic. Um, each meeting also includes participation by the audience, and these meetings are recorded and then made available online. Um, we also have act other activities such as live interviews on Instagram, in-person conversation, which can are also recorded and then available online on Instagram and YouTube. Um, if you have any questions uh, to our guest today, you can send them to me directly, privately through the chat. And after our Q&A, um, I will select those uh, those questions and invite the, the people who did it to either read it out loud or I will read it on their behalf. Um, today, we're joined by our co-host, Shargia Sheikhzadeh and Anush Grati to discuss the ongoing crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh from gender perspective with our guest, who uh, they will introduce now. So, Shagia, the floor is yours. Hello. Nice to see you all here. Um, I would like to proceed with an um, introduction of our guest for today. Uh, so, our first guest is uh, Sevin Samadzada, uh, a feminist researcher, practitioner within the field of gender, peace, and security, focusing on the South Caucasus region. Uh, she has more than eight years' experience of working in uh, various civil society groups in uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, uh, engaged in processes like dealing with the past and researching an alternative history and the daily politics of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, in addition to implementing gender and peace education in the wider region. Uh, as a co-founder of a small local, local initiative called Feminist Peace Collective, uh, she is currently involved in conceptualizing and practicing feminist peace resistance across the South Caucasus uh, through connected feminist uh, theories and uh, practice. Uh, and uh, our second guest is uh, Shayla Pailan. Uh, she is an expert in international criminal law, human rights, and gender, and as well as a, a legal advisor, it's a former legal advisor to the United Nations across countries and regions for more than 15 years. Uh, at the moment, she's based in Yerevan, and she regularly consults for a variety of international organizations, NGOs, uh, think tanks, and governments, and has published extensively on the subject of international justice, uh, self-determination, and the responsibility to protect. So again, welcome. And I would like uh, to go with Anush to start the questions. Thank you, Sharvia, for introducing Sheila and Savinj. Um, so, hi, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Anoush, I'm a volunteer at Red Garden Voices, and I'll just go to the questions, okay? Um, our first question is for Shayla. Hey, Shayla. Um, so, we are right now witnessing a crisis in Karabakh and Armenia with thousands of near displaced people and families. Um, what are some of the gender dimensions of this situation? Um, thanks for the question, uh, and thank you all for inviting me uh, to discuss this important topic uh, with Savinj in particular, who I'm happy to meet today for the first time. Um, this is really not an easy topi topic to discuss. Uh, many people tend to feel that now is not the time uh, to discuss gender perspectives on any, well, specifically the Karbakh conflict. And, you know, I agree, but in the sense that I feel like we should have been talking about this seriously a long time ago. Uh, so the time is long overdue. Uh, the crisis has pretty much left Karabakh as, as now in Armenia um, with over a hundred thousand um, forcibly displaced people. And uh, like in any situation of that sort, women are often disproportionately affected during crises uh, or conflicts. Um, of course, 
both men and women face significant challenges and vulnerabilities in times like this, but gender disparities exacerbate the impact on women in several ways. Um, I'll just touch on, on two. First, you know, women and girls are always at higher risk of experiencing gender-based violence, but during conflicts and displacement, it's, it's a lot more. So this kind of violence can be both a cause and a consequence of, of displacement. Trauma is a contributing factor, uh, severe economic stress, disruption of social structures, disrupted access to services. All of these factors come into play as potentially triggering harmful coping mechanisms. So it's really important to be aware of them and to address them from the outset. And also access to healthcare services uh, becomes really limited um, and stra strained where they may exist. And this of course also affects men and women, uh, but women's access to certain kinds of healthcare like reproductive healthcare, prenatal care, maternal health services, these are really compromised and can lead to severely adverse outcomes. When we consider the present context uh, where there's been nearly 10 months of, of like a slow starvation, preceding the exodus and so many reported miscarriages in the final weeks um, and months even, we have to be especially prepared to address the several particular physical and emotional complications that um, this like disproportionate number of miscarriages in these last weeks have already had on so many Armenian women and will only now be again exacerbated by the added trauma and displacement, the immense loss, as well as potentially a failure, if we don't take that into account, to supplement immediately that kind of health care, um, those kinds of health care services. So the gender dimensions are, in this particular crisis, in this particular time, are many, many, but uh, these two stand out for me. And also quite simply, but I think we're going to discuss this more later, like, the near absolute lack of female leadership agency or participation in any of the peace talks or negotiations or decision-making process that got us into this situation in the first place. So yeah, you know, when I hear now is not the time to discuss this, uh, I, I it makes me really mad because I'm like, we should have been discussing this a long time ago. Um, so I'll stop here for now. Thanks for the question. To say that um, this is so important. I think if we don't give the space and the time as we are doing it right now, um, the kind of different violences will keep on increasing uh, when it comes to to gender. Um, so back to Sevinch, uh, my question will go for like the same kind of aspect. What do you think about the gender dimensions of this conflict conflict in the Azerbaijani society? Yeah, thank you, Anush. Uh, thank you, Sheila, for this um, general introduction of the context, uh, what is happening. And um, I mean, in general, um, we all know that gender dimension of all conflicts or wars are related because gender order itself is um, pretty much related to war and, and politics. And the reason why we, we go with this hypothesis is because um, war reproduces um, gender roles and historically has, has been reproducing gender roles uh, that benefits uh, its own continuity and existence. And, um, and it sets certain roles um, for, uh, for certain gender norms and gender um, expectations, for instance, um, men as protectors and women as uh, someone that needs to be protected. So in this binary spectrum of being masculine and feminine, war redefines these roles and re-strengthens these roles over and over again. And, um, and since the 90s, uh, from the beginning of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the war, we could see how this um, gender dimensions um, has been in place. Um, but also we have to um, pay attention to the consequences of the war, consequences both materially and symbolically to the communities and how later it becomes an instrument, these consequences become an instrument for creating a new form of gender order within the crisis. 
uh, for instance, uh, in the first Karabakh war, Azerbaijan um, lost the war. And because of that, there was a huge understanding of masculine humiliation um, regarding with the loss of territories. And in that sense, the revanchist attitude was always masculinized. It was always masculine. It was not feminine uh, revanchism. And this masculine revanchism was based on the fact that we were dishonored. Uh, we were humiliated as a man um, who lost the territories and lost the war. So, and this humiliation, this masculine humiliation grew so big and so large that today after 30 years, um, they can fulfill their masculine honor this time by uh, winning, so-called winning this war when I believe and I know that uh, there is no winning and losing nations when all of us go through this uh, turbulent and devastating um, uh, consequences of the war, but uh, masculinity and feminine, masculine and feminine roles um, within the gender, uh, within the war, uh, and after the war, uh, creates certain misses, and these misses are also related with the nationalist ones, um, and it basically reproduces the nationalist um, desires uh, of usually the political allies and regime. And unfortunately, what we see now. Um, with a complete and uh, displacement, forced displacement of Armenians from from Karabakh, um, definitely will 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 keep reproducing this um, this problematic gender order in the region. It's not gonna. Uh, it, it will make it even more harder for the region of um, for the women of this region, uh, both Armenians and Azerbaijanis, uh, to be liberated from this patriarchal violence, from this violence that. Uh, war enables to um, to continue over and over. So, um, and I think I agree with Shayla that today is that if we don't talk about these dimensions, I think um, it, um, it, we will basically keep being in the loop of war um, without realizing how patriarchy and war is related, and uh, and how nationalism and gender is related basically. Another um, factor of the yeah, gendered impact of the conflict is the labor of the women um, and, um, and their bodies basically. Women's bodies has always been used uh, for the excuse uh, of their nationalist desires. Women's bodies has been used for reproducing the nation um, and reproducing the soldiers who would fight. Uh, but then again, uh, our bodies have been considered so cheap uh, that uh, along with our other cheap labor, um, that uh, they keep um, uh, enjoying uh, the uh, the exploitation of our bodies, um, and I'm in 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 that manner. I think um, what we will see later with, for instance, with the refugee woman, with the IDP woman, uh, they are the most vulnerable when it comes to being uh, faced uh, with the uh, exploitation. Um, because of not having access to resources and because of this all the scarcity of resources they have to um they will go through um any it, they are very vulnerable basically to any form of exploitation and we know how it is in our region we know how economy um is um is um has been created since the 90s has created so much gap between rich and poor and there's so much poverty. Uh, and this poverty is absolutely gendered. It, it is completely related to the patriarchal violence. So, so far I can probably say um, this and later maybe we can continue this discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Sabine, for such a clear analysis on gender roles when it comes to war and how it impacts on, on, on people. Um, Shargaya, it's, I, I, I pass the word for you. Thank you, Anush. Uh, my question is addressed uh, first to Shela and then to Savinj. Uh, so given the very low percentage of women in government, like in both countries, uh, what uh, role do women play in hostilities? Like, uh, are they an active participants of hostilities, uh, silent victims, silent victims, or, uh, or, or both? Um, well, yeah, in Armenia, um, we don't have, uh, 
a good representation. We have a very low representation of women at the highest level uh, of, of government, like in ministerial positions. Um, but there, there, there is there is a lot of women in government at the sort of middle and lower level positions. And in in the armed forces, there are of course many women who serve in the armed forces, but their participation. And I think this this is not unique to Armenia, obviously in active combat roles is much less common than men's. They tend to serve in more administrative and uh, logistical like support roles uh, or medical support, that kind of thing. That being said, uh, I do think that I've noticed um, in the last two, three years, a strong sense of a need for that to change. Um, not even not even just necessarily as like a gender equality type thing, but a, a real sense of danger and that all uh, all society has to now like bear arms to defend the nation. Um, so we've got more women wanting to take up arms and actively participate in the defense of the country. Uh, so I, I think we're likely to see some shifts in gender sort of in the data there soon. But yeah, for the most part, uh, for the most part, women are mostly victims of major decisions taken by uh, leaders who don't take their perspectives into account and nonetheless severely impact their lives, which is why, you know, it's so important to increase the representation of women um, in those roles uh, so that not just to achieve gender equality, but to make sure that, you know, their their voices and concerns are taken into consideration when these life-changing and nation-changing decisions are, are taken and into shaping policies um, to prevent further conflict, manage it, and work, you know, towards a more sustainable peace. So I, I, I'm sure Seven has a much more sophisticated response than mine since she's, she's uh, such an expert. But, uh, you know, I, I, I speak in these general terms where I, I, the, the gap is so blatantly obvious. Um, and instead of playing an active role, they, be, they, they are these disproportionately affected victims. And the solution is really quite simple to me. Yeah, thank you, Shayla. I mean, I think especially after the war in Ukraine, the question of um, feminist pacifism, like in general, what is our position as a woman when it comes to war? Are we ready for our own self-defense? When the wars are just, when the fighting is just, uh, when can, when actually, what is the, what is the, uh, uh, boundaries um, between uh, between self defense and between um, being on the aggressor side. Basically, this kind of distinctions has been discussed. And where do we stand as a feminist, um, as a as a woman who actually fights with the violence? In our utopia, in our dreams, we don't we don't wish for active violence, right? So, uh, but when when the violence is hitting us hard, um, what are we? What is our response, basically? And I think the war in Ukraine uh, probably brought this discussion um, uh, globally uh, more in a more sober way, in a more clear way that when there is an active aggression, uh, you have a right for self-defense and uh, and um, and female combatants, of course, um, just like male combatants, um, have all the power and mobility to fight um, for for the justice, basically. And feminist self-defense also is like can be discussed from an everyday perspective when, for instance, we face the violence in domestic violence or violence in our communities, how we respond to that if our policy and and the uh, uh, and the state justice system is not responding to this violence. So feminist self-defense is a must, actually, and we have to rethink about it. But overall, um, the, the, this question also brings us to the to another form of political participation that um uh, what is the distinction between uh, again self defense and and nationalist desires so are we fighting for the nationalist male patriarchal desires of a state or are we really fighting for defending our communities against the violence so these kind of questions i think arise when we when we think about it um, and uh, female combatants here yeah, from uh, from azerbaijan and from armenian from karabakh side has uh, has been always always on the backside, but even when they were actively fighting, 
um, they have been the first target as well. I'm sure you all know about the case of Anush who was brutally raped and killed um, um, as a part of war crimes um, 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 and, and, and even recorded and shared. So uh, you can see how even if you are a female combatant, you are extra, you, uh, you are a target of extra violence. Uh, within the war because you are female and your body will be another battlefield, battlefield within the battlefield. Um, uh, but on the other hand, another form of political participation, if we think of it like, if not the militant one, uh, more of uh, in a political um, decision making in the negotiations, uh, it's even more blurry and more complicated because um, just including women in the negotiations, I personally don't believe change uh, will change anything since the structure of negotiations and the whole system that has been there for years and years is very much patriarchal and inclusion of one or two women uh, probably wouldn't challenge the very system, even though they would try, even though they would uh, make sure that women's voices are represented, I still don't believe that it will be possible within such set patriarchal structures, unless it will be coming from the below, unless there will be a demand from a women in our societies that we want to be represented and enough with this patriarchal negotiations that has been decided for our bodies. Um, and and I think only in that way, the true representation of women in the political decision making will be ensured. Because even in Azerbaijan, if you look at it, like in, even in the parliament, there are some women who are uh, in the parliament, but it doesn't mean it means nothing, literally, uh, whatever their voices is. Uh, they are also ideologically very much anti-feminist and anti-women, and they um, they support the statist and nationalist ideas uh, of uh, womenhood. Uh, so, um, so I think we need a different form of uh, resistance. We need a different form of, uh, and actually militant uh, feminist form of resistance, where we will demand the state um, and demand uh, our our governments to um, to uh, to make change instead of being. Um, being a reformist. I know it's a bit different in Armenia because there was a democratic re revolution, a velvet revolution in 2018, but in Azerbaijan in the same year, Aliyev's regime got even stronger and stronger. So there are two different types of regimes in these countries. Uh, but even so, even so within these two different regime types, uh, the patriarchal state still exists and still functions in a quite similar manner that makes women hard to challenge the very system. I'll just add that, and that was amazing, but like I, it's even though we transitioned uh, to uh, like a more democratic state and that th th this war it has has stunted our movement forward. So when I say, you know, you can't bring up, you can bring up gender equality issues, you can't bring up LGBTQ issues, you know what I mean? Like there, it, there's it, 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 not all human rights can be talked about because the war sort of really eclipses um, every other conversation almost. And it's been like that for, for three years. And it's, it's, it, it makes, it makes it really hard to be able to show, you know, how, how, how to actually get out of this conflict mode. Um, it, 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 and, and to be able to sustain attention in that way. So in many ways we have similar problems, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for sure, um, we don't have to do it with an authoritarian regime on top of us, you know, like anymore. So that, 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 that was a really good point. Thank you so much for your answers. Uh, I think I will hand back to Anush. Questions? Thanks, uh, Sharge, yeah. Um, Savinj, this next question is for you. Um, you're part of the Feminist Peace Lab, one of the most outspoken civil society groups in Azerbaijan. Um, could you share a bit about what the collective is about and have you experienced any backlash because of your positions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anush, for the question. Yeah, uh, I'm part of Feminist Peace Collective, which we established um, after the 2020 war in Karabakh, um, because we we felt the need for uniting our voices um, in our collective. We were because we were feeling very much hopeless and powerless. Um, so we decided perhaps we can show some position and at least write something 
so far, most of the things we have done as an activity was just analyzing the situation and writing from the ground what is happening. And yeah, I think we, um, our reaction, of course, received a, a backlash um, uh, from uh, from the state, uh, especially, um, especially after we show we we wrote a statement showing our solidarity with Karabakh after this brutal blockade. Uh, was happening and and also last year we 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 were writing about the Azerbaijan um, Azerbaijan's attack on Armenian territories uh, in last September. So here we were we have been following all the events very closely and and writing about it, um, which um, received the backlash from the state uh, so much that uh, they uh, started uh, spending some time and researching and and putting forward not only our collective as a group but also us individually and targeting us um, writing uh, very humiliating texts about us um, and connecting us to uh, western donors saying that we are funded by west that's why we are writing this or we are backed by armenia even uh, in the tv in the state sponsored tv they made a reportage about us <laughs> saying that uh, we are related to uh, Anna Hokopian, uh, the uh, first lady of Armenia, and so on. So they were trying to find a means to um, attack us. Um, but um, I think, and, they, and finally, of course, they banned our website in Azerbaijan. That's usually what they do uh, to uh, prevent us from reaching the public. Uh, but of course, we are bashing this backlash, and we have our own ways of continuing uh, our to state our voice. And uh, we know the we know how the uh, the the what the logic of Azerbaijani state. We are very much familiar with their tactics, and we are also very much familiar with the misses that they want to create. For instance, by connecting us to this uh, Western, <laughs> saying that we are connected to Western donors and so on. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we received this backlash, which we are carefully observing and and uh, have our own response to it. Uh, but I think it is a natural process uh, of um, when state wants to get as much hegemony and uh, and the regime wants to get as much hegemony as as possible and to um, basically stop any voice that is anti-war in Azerbaijan. And you probably know already that um, some of our friends and colleagues are in prison just because of their uh, status. It, their their social media starts about uh, being anti-war so it's very much expected but it also shows how much paranoid the Azerbaijani state is at this moment when they know that they can no more justify their war as much easily as they used to be uh, because 2020 war was justified because it was very much um, uh, for a lot of Azerbaijanis getting back the surrounding regions of Karabakh was very much important. And they, of course, created a lot of propaganda around it that war is necessary and so on. And it was pandemics on top of that. So there were a lot of like continuous of events that made, just made them easily start the war. But, but after 2020, it's a bit tricky that every time they go through this like small levels of aggressions and, and wars, uh, so, yeah, and for them, a, a collective like us, which has dimension of anti-war and feminism, which is uh, not so popular in Azerbaijan, uh, it makes them, it makes for them easy to target us, but also um, it's the most radical way we can respond back to them. Thank you, Savinj. Thanks for such an important work that you're doing despite, like, all... Um... English is not my mother tongue, so I, I have like a bit of a broken English, but it's such an important word despite everything that is, how do you say that when you have all of these barriers yeah, around you um, and so dangerous right? also? You mean challenge. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Sheila, the next question is for you. So you worked with crimes against humanity in Cambodia, Rwanda, and former Yugoslavia, right? So do you see any, any of the conciliation process in those cases replicable in the armenian azerbaijani Karabakh context? Um, yeah, to be honest, I used to, but it's so hard to envisage now. And I, I feel really bad saying that because I'm an eternal optimist, but uh, maybe it's just the time, like the way the way that Azerbaijan handled this situation 
was so unfortunate. Like that's an understatement. <laughs> Uh, by starving, bombing, like, you know, to get them to subjugate, it's not in any way, shape or form conducive to any kind of trust or reconciliation. And the damage done, like this is uh, the Armenian people for them to have to leave their historic, their, their lands, like not in an ownership sense, but like they're connected to that land. It's, it, this is, I don't even, I don't even know how to describe the, the, the pain. Um, so it's going to have far, re far reaching repercussions and you can't just undo or fix that, you know, and it, I think it really destroyed um, to a very significant degree, uh, a chance for peaceful resolution or conciliation. Um, that being said, you know, this isn't the first time the world sees this. I've worked in cases like this before. Um, the, 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 context of Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, um, there was a need to reintegrate displaced people back into their um, communities, uh, former homes, and it, it had ma main, many problems. There were property disputes. There was like, it's, it's tough, you know, um, but there are projects that ha have existed and have been met with like limited success. One in particular that I'm always looking at, um, and I was hoping that we we would be able to have a project like that before this crap happened, you know, like it's such a lost opportunity. UNHCR uh, launched this project called Imagine Coexistence. <laughs> and that was in 2001. Um, there were like a bunch of joint activities for members of diff like the different ethnic groups uh, on, on all kinds of different levels, like uh, economic, um, art, all of it. And uh, this was even during a time when there was a lot of resistance and hostility to the idea of remixing these communities. But uh, when you have an international organization that, you know, gets in there and supervises the process, like it had some success. The, one of the main problems with the program, though, was it was a pilot project. It ran for 18 months and then it stopped. Like, that's really not enough time. Um, and uh, so many of those programs ended when the funding ended and then people late leave. Um, that creates a lot of mistrust in the communities. They feel abandoned, you know. So I was hoping, like, I, I had been talking about this and, and saying, let's do this, but with a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, you know, um, because you, when it comes to Armenians and Azerbaijanis, you cannot reverse properly that level of deep mistrust and animosity in so little time. And now with what happened, I'm not sure, like, I don't even know where we could even think to begin, you know. Uh, I, I really honestly don't see it possible under the current regime, like the Aliyev regime cannot, like there's no way until that regime changes and that there's a free and democratic society or at least one that's close, closer, <laughs> um, we're not going to be able to have lasting peace or reconciliation. And just, it's gonna be a very militarized and defensive aggressive situation until, until both sides are speaking the same language, not literally, but you know what I mean? The language of peace. Um, yeah, that's, that's unfortunately the way I see it. Yeah. Which is not very hopeful at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Shayla. It's such a wake up call to, to, to hear this from the diaspora side, right? Um, Shergia, it's all yours. Thank you. And, uh, again, my question is addressed to both of you, or first to Savinj and then to Shayla. Uh, are there any connections between Azerbaijani and Armenian feminist activists or groups? And can you, uh, can this be a tool in conflict resolution? Yeah, thank you for the question, Shergia. Uh, they are like mostly individual contacts i would say from the from uh, different programs and from academia and so on how people um, in this region are connected especially from armenian and azerbaijan feminist scholars or feminist activists uh, there is no systematic um connection or coordination uh, but there is a lot of possibility and that's one of the things that i am researching and i'm trying to understand 
uh, and uh, and um, also um, initiatives. There is an impossibility between this all concepts of theor theories of uh, feminism and feminist resistance um, applicable for our region, and how is it applicable for our region? Uh, and is there a chance for any uh, regional feminist resistance or transnational uh, so-called feminist resistance uh, in the South Caucasus? And there are lots of opportunities. So there are lots of chances because, first of all, um, a lot of things that connects us as women and as uh, feminized bodies or as uh, as queer bodies, uh, there is there are a lot more things that connects us um, in this region through this facing the similar patriarchal violence and similar um, uh, capitalist extractivist um, and 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 state violence that we have seen. Um, lots of stories are similar, um, and um, even we started uh, with Caucasus talks and other regional initiative, uh, small um, uh, small process where we were asking. Um, um, women or people, um, queer people or feminized bodies to ex uh, to tell us their stories of sexual harassment, uh, kind of like Me Too movement globally, but we wanted to make it more specifically for the Caucasus region. And uh, and we could see how similar stories is. We didn't even need a, a country or a border to define where the story comes from because they were very much similar. And, uh, and you, you can see how much this uh, common pain and uh, common grievances um, um, it can connect us uh, and connect our struggles. So, um, and 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 on, on the other hand, feminist resistance means that we are gonna we are we are fighting and we we will be fighting with uh, different levels of power structures. Um, and within these power structures, we cannot uh, fight uh, alone. Um, it, it it's it's very hard to imagine to fight with the certain powers, which seems quite abstract on one hand, uh, when you uh, know that your own fight within certain national borders uh, is not enough and and uh, connecting these fights connecting these uh, struggles are very much much important and perhaps anush can also uh, uh, um, uh, talk about it for someone coming from argentina that how is it it is for the feminists in latin america how uh, the regional aspect of feminist resistance uh, is helping to to connect these tr struggles um, and also it also challenged the very idea of nationalism because um, nationalism has been the main source of disease uh, and miseries uh, in uh, in post-Soviet countries and in 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 the Caucasus as well, and this uh, extensive nationalism that led to all this violence and all this uh, violent state building process. Um, equally exploited women uh, to to make their nationalist projects uh, ongoing. And therefore, um, yeah, there is a huge chance for feminist resistance across the uh, South Caucasus and especially um, between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, to connect. Uh, but again, just to be clear that this is um, this is this is this is the utopia or this is an imagine imaginary um, idea that has potential to happen. It's not something that is impossible. It's something that uh, has much more possibility to happen than any I, I I would say any other form of social movements in the region because if you look at for instance socialist leftist movements in the region they are quite uh, fall apart and there is not much uh, connection mostly there were some liberal groups NGOs that were connected let's say for instance gender uh, or women's work working on gender or organizations working on gender they are also very much fall apart after the 2020 war. I would say the only form of resistance, a true resistance that uh, right now has potential to connect is feminism. Taylor, would you like to add something? Yeah, I mean, I the question was if there are any connections between um Azerbaijani and Armenian feminist activist group I honestly don't know um I I, I like I, in terms of conflict resolution there's just this one group that came to me because I only moved to Armenia two and a half years ago so I'm still like I'm barely Armenian. I just became a citizen last year but still anyways uh this there's a joint liaison there's a it's called Jolig. There's a joint Armenian-Azerbaijani liaison group. 
on confidence building measures to support uh, whatever. It's a really long title uh, to support lasting peace in the South Caucasus. Uh, that sort of, which does that sort of activity of trying to do, um, uh, um, yeah, like confidence, like a track two or a, a bottom up a type of, of um, reconciliation or process. But that group has only two women on it. They're like 10, I think they're 12 now, six on each side. Each side has only one woman. It's, it's, it's classic tokenism, you know, it's classic where I, I go there. I'm like, again, are we doing this again? I, 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 I just, can't we have equal representation of women in an endeavor even like this? No, you know, it's like, doesn't even cross people's minds. So uh, the work is, it, it's basically, I found like these women are just trying to get the gender factor a little bit on the agenda when we even come up with the confidence building measures, you know, and that looks to me like very, uh, well, it is sort of superficial, you know, it's just, we need to check a box. It's a, it, enough of that. That's, that's not going to work. That's, that's actually really counter, counterproductive. So um, I, again, I think that the, the main tool for conflict uh, resolution, uh, like I said, will be, um, or lasting peace is regime change. And, and for that, obviously, to the extent that there is any independent civil society left in Azerbaijan, which I'm not, I, I assume there isn't, uh, whatever is left of it has a huge role to play. And, you know, feminist activist organizations uh, need to reach out to each other. Um, and, and, you know, the Feminist Peace Collective really recently came to my attention. And when I saw it, I was like, I, I think I saw it during the blockade when, when um, they tweeted or somehow it came to my attention. I don't even remember how. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> this is great, right? So we need more of that. And um, there is there is still like default position mistrust, even from feminists or, you know, women, women's organizations on, I, I suppose, like I can speak only from this side where, uh, I, this is why I want to do this, you know, to show like, we have to have these conversations. It doesn't matter if the person is Azerbaijani, we have to talk to them, but it, it, even if they're hard to talk to, and in this case, Sevin just such a delight. <laughs> this is delightful, you know, um, because I really feel that we, I'm sure we disagree on many things as well. We'll find out. And I hope that we're going to keep, keep this, you know, conversation going. Um, but there's a certain level at which uh, I I do I, I'm gonna say it, like women can speak to each other in a in a really constructive way and that is going to be a huge key to finally ending this never ending nightmare that we need to like work on you know what I mean yeah okay thank you so much for your answers uh, and the floor is yours again. Thanks. Um, we are about to finish all the questions. Just wanted to say that to me, this space like meeting Sheila and Savinsh is a way of connecting both like Armenian and Azerbaijani feminism and from Argentina and trying to uh, to to see who are those people working on uh, feminism and which are the main conflicts and how are they working this is so powerful and so empowering uh, because we had no north from the diaspora side to see like where is the connection and how we can reach out and who we can meet in the territories to to speak about this these issues so um, thank you for for your time and for all your work so our last questions to you both is um, what can gender perspective offer to deal with the humanitarian and political situations where the Karabakh conflict is at the moment? Um, okay, maybe I'll, I'll just I'll just because I feel like I've we've I feel like I've already answered that question <laughs> a couple of times, but uh, then I'll let Savinj take take it 
uh, from from my like slight repetition, just I really think that we need more female representation. And I know that it, I don't mean it as a tokenist thing. And even if we have to deconstruct the patriarchal whole entire system, it, it there is something to be said, even just optically of having equal representation. That That is important for women to see and then feel like there is a space for them as well to reach those heights and be part of the conversation. Um, it, it's the, 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 the answers are gonna be too long. So I, I just think, you know, it's mostly the gender perspective, uh, what it can offer is inherent in the exposition of it, you know, and every voice is going to have their own version of it. So I, I, I highly like to whoever's listening or may listen in the future, like speak up, don't be afraid of having feminist values or, you know, and whether you're a man or a woman or, or non-binary, it's, it's really, uh, this, it now is not the time to discuss. No, now is the time to discuss. Like now's the time to talk about this and, um, you know, we have to approach this conflict from a new perspective. It can't be the same. So Savinj said this before, one of those new perspectives is the gender perspective. It's not the only one, okay? But this one is a big one. And it's it's like, I'm not gonna shut up about it anymore. <laughs> not that I was, but you know, I, I really hope that, that um, in fact, that thought of like when when someone tries to shove shove it to the side by saying this is not a priority we need to we need to push back on that uh and bring that gender perspective back into the light and say no 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 we're not doing it the same way again we're not because that's not working right um so that's going to be my answer Yeah, thank you, Shayla. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I think um, we need like this small hopes and small connecting points where we can go forward a little bit rather than going backwards, because every time this aggression, the war and um, and the, the crisis happens, we are basically put in this perpetual state of violence that takes us way much back. Because I have seen, like I've been part of different groups of um, uh, civil society groups, even uh, like exclusively uh, female women groups uh, from Armenia and Azerbaijan, where there was this discussion of peace building, reconciliation and so on. But once the crisis happened, these groups fell apart uh, and it shows how the ideological ground of uh, connecting women has been so weak, basically, because most of the time women were coming from the position of victimhood rather than from the position of power, from the position that whatever connects us is beyond our being, us being victims. And, uh, and in that sense, I... I, I want to say it out loud, maybe it will sound a bit populist, but I think uh, women uh, and uh, queer people of Armenia and Azerbaijan should unite. Uh, and this is a call for uh, for um, all of us. And it's uh, it's beyond just being a marginal group because feminists in, in both countries are quite marginal. Uh, but there is a there is a thin line, and there is a actually quite big opportunity between connecting our radical ideas with um, uh, with massive um, consciousness, with uh, with people's grievances, uh, because um, because people um, know people have lived through uh, all this uh, pain uh, of war and and conflict, and if um, the only chance for us to uh, go beyond this. Um, and and connect us is um, is thinking rethinking about yeah how we can unite women of this region how we can unite um, um, feminine bodies of this region and how we can unite uh, queers of this region because we are the we are in the scale of oppression <laughs> I think we are we uh, we know where we stand um, uh, so. Uh, this gendered dimension is again uh, not something that we will discuss. Like I don't see my position at this point discussing um, uh, 
um, the necessity of uh, thinking the gender dimension of uh, conflict or coexistence or coexistence or even this peace treaty that they are talking about over and over. I don't see my position there to go and to recommend to give some recommendations to Aliyev's regime and says that you have to consider this when you will prepare your peace agreements. I absolutely see it on the other spectrum. I see me not personally and individually, but um, us as a group of women uh, demanding demanding how we imagine living together, demanding how we uh, see our future um, uh, and how we see peace in general, because for them, they have instrumentalized peace for us for so long. For them now, they have made us believe that now there is no distinction between peace and war because they conduct their wars uh, for peace. So um, in, in the middle of this confusion and this um, distractions, I think, and I will say it again, women and queers of Armenia and Azerbaijan should unite. This is so, so power powerful. Thank you both so much. Um, Diego, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. If there's any other, please send them to me privately. So, um, Aidan, I don't know if you're there, if you wanna ask out loud the question you you suggested. I done. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. Otherwise, uh, Fidan uh, had a note that maybe you would like to share uh, also. Um, it's more it's more like a reflection than a than a question, but I think it's interesting to to share it. So if you want to share it, you can please uh, reactivate your audio and share it. And if there is other any other questions, um, just let me know. Okay, maybe Mane, you wanna ask a question? Yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, hi everybody. First of all, thank you very much. I think this was uh, super informative uh, for everybody participating. So I just want to thank the two guests uh, for an amazing panel. And I actually have two questions, one to Savinch, one to Shayla. I hope I'm pronouncing your name. <laughs> um, so the question to Savinch is the following because she brought it up during her um, initial question. Um, in the context of, for example, the war in Ukraine and the war that we have here, what do you think um, should be the feminist perspective on the fact of mandatory conscription of only males into the armed forces? Because there is an obvious conflict between uh, national security, right? So we obviously do not live in a utopia where, unfortunately, that conscription can be waved away as something that is fundamentally violating human rights. That's number one. But on the other hand, as a feminist from either one of these places, how would you reconcile um, your desire to not participate in violence with your desire to not be relegated to a protected class? So seeing your peers who are male, basically, participating in active combat, whereas you are um, framed as a protected class, somebody who cannot um, be active in any way in this context. And I'll ask the question to Shayla immediately so I can <laughs> mute myself. Uh, Shayla, my question is after the um, forced, uh, like fleeing the refugee crisis, the um, forced exodus of uh, the population uh, outside of Nagorno Karabakh, obviously a lot of questions of um, social security employment come up uh, in conflict zones like this? And do you think that upcoming economic hardship, which is obviously going to happen to a lot of the families that are relocating, and I'm willing to bet that a lot of these families don't have really a gender balance in terms of uh, income, are going to get exasperated specifically for women when they find it hard to, for example, find jobs in Armenia, because we know that the situation inside of Armenia itself is not, let's say, economically that great for women already. So do you think that that is going to further kind of exasperate 
their already uh, vulnerable position. That's it for me. I hope in three minutes we're not going to run out of that. Thank you, Mana, for the questions. Um, yeah, and for the reflection in generally, like bringing up this topic of um, uh, self defense um, and uh, and and the gender aspect of it in terms of how it is this division of who can fight and who cannot fight is uh, is defined. Um, I think one of the first questions is, of course, this, um, uh, for instance, the case of Ukraine. Um, I, I can even bring another cases, for instance, case of Rojava in, 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 in northern Syria, where uh, uh, female combatants have been actively fighting. They have been also fighting against uh, ISIS. Um, and um, and um, and they were fighting for freedom for revolutionary ideas. So um, one of the questions when the, 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 the idea of conspiracy conscription comes. The question is, um, the mandatory conscription in itself is already the violent way of how states um, use the bodies of uh, its citizens, and usually the male bodies uh, for the for for the upfront. But when when the violence hits at the door, when when uh, your very existence is at threat, um, I think the fighting for for the justice, fighting against um, imperialism, for instance, or fighting against colonialism and uh, all the other forms of oppression becomes necessity. And there, when you fight against um, these levels of powers or, or oppression, um, it becomes inevitable that the gender of the fighter, gender of the uh, fighting subject uh, doesn't matter because it's not... Um, it's not re reinforced by the state. So it's not reinforced by the state of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Rojava, like that time Rojava. Yeah? They were not reinforcing that you have to fight. You, We are conscripting you, we are writing you that you have to fight. People were fighting, people were mobilizing themselves because they had to uh, fight to stay alive and to stay to save their lands, basically. But when the states are involved, I think this actor of state itself is the problematic actor when we, under when, when we try to understand the roles, the gender roles, because the whole military system, the whole arm system is uh, is for the is for the continuity of states or for the strength and power and security of the state. And and sometimes we lost this distinction between the state security and the security of people. What they mean by state security is actually not the same as, as the people's security. Uh, and from a feminist perspective on security, we question that. We say, wait a second, whose security are we talking about? When you say that we are we are trying to save our lands and save our borders and so on, um, whose whose security? are you maintaining usually it's the ruling elites like even in the times of crisis the first things they care about is their own bodies in is their own security the ones who are in the ruling elite and the ruling regime rather than the people's security um so it's it goes beyond again the idea of nationalism for instance there were a lot of criticism of anarchists uh, who are fighting in Ukraine because the question was that if you are anarchist how you can uh, fight you are you should be um, um, inherently anti-war and you shouldn't fight while you're taking guns and fight fight uh, but the answer for that was quite simple that anarchists are not fighting for the uh, for the great nationalist desire of Ukrainian state but they are fighting to save their lands and to save their people so uh, this two different like differentiation between the two these two different Different consciousness is very important and because of that then again uh, female combatants whether they, they can fight or not it should be their own decision and if states are imposing on to people saying that who is abled who can fight and who cannot fight um, uh, this is already in itself um, shows uh, how the wars are organized and uh, and and continues so yeah, my my probably short answer is that the, the division of the gender division of who can fight and who cannot fight is usually decided by the states. And in general, also who can fight and who cannot fight, who can be militant and who cannot be militant also is decided by the states again. And that's why people who are part of non-state actors, they are easily labeled as terrorists if they take guns. And uh, yeah, so once you are not part of state, you will all, always be targeted. Um, 
as a as an other or as a as a terrorist or as a non-state actor. But yeah, I hope this answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if I recall, the the question was uh, the sort of uh, what is the the economic sort of um, factor or element that that we need to look out for in the gen gender dimension of that. Uh, yeah, the the massive influx of refugees uh, has um, created the the situation that we're going to down the line have to um, create jobs for them if they're going to stay, you know. At the moment, there's a, a massive relief effort. That's not something that we need to think about for, for tomorrow. You know, the, the, like the more pressing concern is enough housing. <laughs> Where are they going to sleep? Uh, and of course, like in, like in any um, situation, uh, you know, traditionally, Armenian women uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, are caregivers. You know, they they they're not like a massive part of the of the workforce. Uh, they shoulder primary responsibility for caring for the families. And um, if if in that context uh, a man doesn't have a job to go to this will create not just economic stress, which they're all going to have to experience now, but also that sense of humiliation or that sense of loss of honor. And that will feed into the first point that I, uh, that risks feeding into the first point, uh, which is an increase maybe in harmful coping mechanisms. So we, we do need to make sure that not just uh, to give money, but to give them something to do you know what I mean uh so that they feel productive and and it's part of the the it's part of the 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 daily um survival process uh but if we're really going to take this seriously you know women have also traditionally what if they work they work in you know women type roles like cleaning or or what have you carrying um, and there is no, I, I don't see that as being um, problematic. It's going to be mostly uh, at the moment, it's a housing issue. All families are getting money. All families are are um, getting what they need for right now. Uh, but in the long term, in the long run, yes, we do need to make sure that uh, that economic employment opportunities are also available and um yeah that's 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 one of many that's also one of many other dimensions to consider thank you mané sheila and sevinch and also anush Sharghiya and everybody who participated for your questions and for your answers um we are running out of time so i wanted to thank you all for joining today um maybe i'll just um, I think a lot of topics uh, have been covered, but also there, there are more topics to discuss uh, on this uh, topic. <laughs> so uh, maybe we will soon have another meeting where we will uh, to cover this, this, um, these other uh, questions that maybe were left unanswered. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining. Um, and I hope that this was interesting for everybody who's, who's joined and everybody who's watching it afterwards. So yeah, thank you everybody and have a nice day. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.